very good evening and welcome to the Kunsthistorisches Museum. Um, we've done a lot of these artist talks and that is the first time uh, an artist has been clapped onto the stage. So that's, thank you. I know, it's trouble. It's trouble. <laughs> trouble ahead. There is expectation in the room now. We owe them something. Um, so a very good evening. Uh, my name is Jasper Sharp. I'm the museum's uh, adjunct curator for modern and contemporary art. This evening is the third in a series of artist talks that we are doing throughout the year. Uh, and it's a huge pleasure to welcome Kerry James Marshall back to Vienna together with his wife, Cheryl. <clears throat> So, uh, in, any uh, any of the people from Secession in the room? And that are you back there? Is that you? <laughs> Old friends Good in the room. Good to see you. Is Sylvie back there too? <laughs> oh, really? She said she's coming. Um, I don't know if I just let this carry on for a while, or I uh, <laughs> or I give you a little. Where's Chris, Chris? Chris Jenner's here. Where? Where do you see? Chris Jenner's here, oh, right here. Chris yeah. <laughs> Um, I know a few people here as well. I can play this game as well. Yeah. Um, so, I'm just going to take this away for a minute. Um, Kerry, it, it sounds stupid to do an introduction now, but I'll just do it anyway, because it's written on this damn piece of paper. Um, Kerry is one of the most uh, acclaimed and interesting painters and printmakers working today, expectation. Um, <laughs> He was born in Burning, Birmingham, Alabama in 1955. He moved as a small boy to Los Angeles. Uh, lived through some pretty uh, uh, climactic events which uh, have, have, have influenced his work and his life ever since there. Um, in around 1965, when he was a fifth, fifth grader, he made his first forays into the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, which was a relatively new museum at the time and encountered historical art. Some of it very old, some of it less old, American Abstract Expressionism. He caught the bug and he applied and was accepted to study at the Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles. Um, he had a stint in New York in the 80s, which included a residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And, and in, a wife. And a wife. <laughs> Not in that order. We'll do the wife first, and an artist the residency. Museum first, then yeah. the wife. Um, through the studio museum. Through the studio museum, okay. Museum's a great place um, to pick up. Museums are good places to pick up. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. The galleries are open until nine o'clock tonight, so. Um, um, oh God, I'm I, we'll just do the biography tonight, and then we'll just call it a day. Uh, anyway. Uh, Kerry moved to Chicago in 1987. Uh, he began teaching at University of Illinois, which he did for 12 years. And in 1991, he was the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship, which is 98. 1998, he was the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship, which is more commonly known as a Genius Grant. Expectation. So I have to admit that it's mildly intimidating to be sharing the stage with someone who has been officially termed a genius, but I am going to do my best to uh, forget that fact this evening. I'll go light on you. Go light on me. Um, <laughs> Kerry, it's a real pleasure to have you here this evening. Thank you very much for coming. The plan for this evening is to meander through the last 30 or 40 years, stopping at around 12 pitches along the way, and finishing at Kerry's extraordinary picture which is hanging now um, alongside Tintoretto, Susanna and the Elders. How did, how did we get there? Um, I need a little clicker. So this is a, uh, this is a very well-known work of yours, a tiny work of yours. It's massively out of scale on the screen. It's literally the size of a book cover uh, which you made in 1980 when you were just 25 years old. Uh, it's painted on paper using egg tempera. Before we get to the actual work, could you just talk a little bit about your upbringing and about your first exposure to art and museums and how that happened? Well, you, you, you just did it. <laughs> but, what, what, but, when you, but what made you go into, the, well, into LACMA? I mean... Well, I, because they took me there on a school bus. I didn't have much choice. <laughs> the thing is, I didn't... I mean, you... you, you 
what most people have to remember, I mean, you, you have no idea. I, I, I didn't know there was such a thing as a museum. I didn't know there was such a person called an artist. You know, you don't know these things at first. I mean, these things are things you pick up over time. But what I, what I did know and what I, what I the, the, the transformative experience is an experience. I talk about it all the time. Everybody in here probably already knows it. When I was in kindergarten, literally, I had the transformative experience that made me the person that I am today. It shaped my life from that moment until now. So I went to, in Birmingham, we went, there were a couple of things about this experience. So we went, in Birmingham, went to a Catholic school when I started school called Holy Family. So we went there because my mother's sister had her kids in that school. And you know, they were old, her son was older than, than, than uh, my brother and I. So Holy Family was the, the school in Inslee, which was the section of Birmingham that I was, I was born in. I was born in, in Holy Family Hospital, where my aunt was a nurse. Uh, but when I started kindergarten, the teacher who was there, her name is Mary Hill, who, and I, I give her that honor all the time, and when I was, when I had a survey show in 2005 that opened at the MCA in Chicago and it traveled through the, through the states and closed at the Birmingham Museum, she was still alive. And somebody, I mentioned her name at, in the talk I was giving at the museum and somebody in the audience says, I know Mary Hill, I know where she lives. And she told me to tell you to come by her house. <laughs> And, uh, and so, but the thing was that she, what she did, she, in kindergarten, she kept a scrapbook of pictures and, and greeting cards and Christmas cards and things she had clipped out of National Geographic magazines, things like that. And looking through that scrapbook changed my life because it was the thing that made me say that this is what I want to do. I want to make pictures like these pictures and I want to make pictures that will make other people feel the way these pictures are making me feel. That was the thing that, that shaped me. And from that moment, literally, I became obsessed with collecting pictures and looking at pictures. And so I became a compulsive image collector from that moment. I mean, until I started unloading a lot of the pictures I had been clipping, I had thousands and I could, there was never a book I could pick up that I didn't want to cut up. <laughs> and what sort of age, what sort of age is this? So I was five years old. <laughs> so, but the other thing about Birmingham, so, and this is, this is where, a, in, in a way, the sort of black Birmingham uh, has an impact on who, who I am too. So we went to Catholic school, not because we were Catholic, because I wasn't Catholic. We went to Catholic school because it was a school where you could get the better education. We were Catholic schools, but everybody went to Baptist church. But the thing is, that the, the, on the campus of the school, they had a chapel. And for, so you, they used to have a noon mass every day but for the kids who were in school, you couldn't go in the chapel until you were in second grade. But when you lined up after recess, you would line up along the wall by the door. And when you looked in that door and you saw that interior space, it was a magical thing. I, you, it's like it was another world. It was all white in there and gold. There were statues all over the place. There was gold candlesticks. There was silver instruments. All of this stuff was in there. And when you looked in there, it just, it looked like heaven already. And then the fact that you couldn't, as, as a kindergartner and a first grader, you couldn't go in there, <laughs> it just made it even that more, much more uh, in, enticing. And so, but, and so the thing, so here's another thing. So if you go to that church and then you go to the Baptist church, the differences were extreme. It was like night and day. The Baptist church was much more austere in the way it was decorated because there wasn't much decoration in there. It was pretty plain, you know, some pretty brown, plain church pews, you know, a brown altar, you know, like a lectern. I mean, just a, a, it, it, it wasn't fancy in any way at all. And then there were the fans, you know, pictures of Jesus on the back. Um, and so there was something about the austerity of the, the, that church where what was, what, was transit, trans, what was transformational about that was always located in the body of the practitioners. So the, the way people behaved in church was completely different than the way people behaved in the Catholic church. In the Catholic church, there was a lot of ceremony. 
people dressed up. My cousin was an altar boy, and so they had that nice little white outfit on with the frills and the lace and stuff. And they got to can carry that candle snuffer around and then swing that incense ball and all that stuff. That stuff was, that was one thing. But in the Catholic church, people were screaming. And in the Baptist church, people would be screaming. And so those two things had an impact on me in terms of establishing the difference between the way things were experienced in the body and the way things were experienced in presentations in terms of sculpture and artwork and things like that. So those things had an impact on me too. And how old are you when you are making, when you are aware that you are making things? When does, when, does it, when does clipping things and making collages go from being something that a child does with a glue stick to you're aware that you're making something that might even be art? Well, the thing, when we, we moved to California in 1963, so this was just before I was gonna turn eight, and uh, I went to 49th Street Elementary School but on television in LA, there was a program that came on called John Nagy Learned to Draw. And that show, his, his whole approach to teaching you how to draw was formal and structural. And it was, it was the old Cezanne, you know, where's my, my sphere, my cube, and my cone? <laughs> I mean, that was, that was the way he taught. And so what, it seemed, what he seemed to be doing was unlocking the key to the, way, the reason why things look the way they look. And it was based on the fact that if you know some things about how things are structured, then it's easy for you to do anything you want with that thing. And so that's how I started out. I mean, I used to sit in front of the TV and watch that show every time and go along with him on those exercises. And then you can go to, there was, in, in LA, there were thrifty drug stores and Cress's Five and Dime. I don't know if anybody in here has any idea what that is. But these five and 10 cent stores. But John Nagy also sold this kit called the John Nagy Learn to Draw Kit. And it had, you know, a sketch pad and, you know, some, a ruler and some things like that. And you'd buy that kit and you can follow along with the exercises you did on TV. And I was religiously invested in following those exercises. And I think that was the thing that made me, under, made me believe on some level that making art had nothing to do with personal expression. It was, all of what, it was all about the way in which you structured and articulated ideas through the way you used it, built images. And so this is why this, this, this phrase that Duchamp used about Seurat means a lot to me. He says, I like Seurat because Seurat builds paintings like a carpenter. That stuff means a lot to me. And so when I make my pictures, I'm think, this is how I'm thinking about what I'm doing. And this is how I'm starting to approach the building of my, my uh, the, the perfection of my craft and the abilities to do and to see and to know and to understand things while I'm trying to make myself into it, into the artist who wants to be in the museum like the LA County Art Museum, which was the thing that when I went on that trip, I said, I want to be in here too. I don't want to just come in looking at what other people are doing. I want to be in here. And that's how, literally, that's how I got myself started. And let me yeah, yeah. just, uh, I'll go, cut go, it just go, before go. you, <laughs> because you, so we, we got a chance to look at the show uh, earlier today when the museum was closed. So Jasper, uh, Angela Chun, and I walked through the museum and looked at all, it looked all of, we hit all the highlights <laughs> and uh, all our favorites and then the way the show was installed. And on two occasions you said something about two other artists who were in that show who said the same thing. When we were talking about Catherine Oakley, who said, I always wanted to see my work in an environment like this amongst these masterworks. And then Peter Doig, who said, I spent all my life working to make sure I could get my work in a place where it would be among these other works. So that's how I saw myself, and so that's how my ambition was shaped. I really, I only wanted to be a part of this for all my life. And so everything I did was to get me to a place where I could be a part of this. You know, and I'm a part of this. I feel like we just, <laughs> I, I feel like we just need to crack open a bottle of champagne. So. Um, I feel like we need to call a waiter and get some champagne here and just open it for everyone. And, um, let's talk quickly about this picture because I'm, I'm conscious that I've got some others racked up behind it. This is a, a, a work called A Portrait of the Artist as a Shadow of His Former Self. This was a work which represented a little bit of a tide change mm -hmm. for you. You'd been working primarily abstractly with collage. Yeah. 
what what was the trigger to lead you off in another in another direction with a work like this? Well, it's one you've not you've not abandoned since. I mean, it's gone through various passages and. Oh, and this is this is foundational. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if you if you you take into account what I just said uh, a, a moment ago, that my my concept of what it meant to be an artist was to be uh, a, a part of a, of, of a long sort of narrative history um, <clears throat> that some people think of in terms of the development of styles or movements. Um, but it's, it's, it's the thing that uh, Arthur Danto had called the discourse of reasons. It's like the reason why, why would you do one thing as opposed to another thing? Or are you limited to only the thing that you do? You know, so certain artists become identified with doing a certain kind of thing, and that becomes their thing. Uh, and, and there are people who are, who, who are, are locked in to that. Well, I, because of the way I came into the art world, I thought it was my responsibility to know how to do everything uh, and to be able to do everything. So. Uh, along with having gone to the museum that first time. I went to the library all the time. I looked at every single art book that was in the library. Not picking out the things I was interested in, but simply looking at every single book that was on the shelf because I thought it was important to know what everything, everything that was possible to do. And so I spent time, I tried to learn how to do Japanese brush painting. I was doing, I, I, I bought, a copper plate, a hard ground ball, and an etching needle, and a bottle of nitric acid at an art supply store. And I tried to teach myself how to do etching because I was looking at Rembrandt and Whistler. And I did everything up to the point where you had to put the plate in the acid because I was scared of the acid. <laughs> no, and I never, literally, that bottle, <laughs> when I, I, I moved out of my parents' house and I was going to New York, that was when that bottle of acid got thrown away. I bought that when I was about 14. It stayed in the box. I was scared to open it. And I was scared to open it because I had watched a lot of Vincent Price movies. And in the Vincent Price horror movies, they always throw acid in somebody's face and then they melt like that <laughs> wax. <laughs> and so I was, a, literally, I was afraid to open it. Um, but that was the thing, so I tried to do everything. And so in the, in the course of, uh, the course of my, my, uh, my education as, a, as an artist, I was trying to, literally trying to do everything. And so when I, I arrived at a period when everybody had said figurative painting was over, you, know, you couldn't do that kind of work anymore, and a lot of people were doing abstract work. And so I started doing some abstract stuff too, uh, and then doing collage work because I'd been looking at Romare Beard and, you know, uh, but it, it, it got to a point with the abstract work for me where producing another work seemed to not be challenging enough to do it again. It's like it, it started to, I started to arrive at this sort of place where you said, well, you know, but if you, you push the paint around for a certain amount of time and, you know, throw enough colors and stuff in there, eventually it's going to turn into something that looks kind of all right. And for a lot of people, that kind of all right was okay, but it wasn't okay for me. And so when, when it ceased to be a challenge to make another picture that was abstract, I started look, go, figuring out what it, it's like, what is it, that, what is it that I really want? And what I really wanted was to do some work that made use of all the things that were, were possible to be known about the art of making pictures. And so if you had spent any time as, as I had done with, with, with one of my uh, favorite professors at, at Otis, you know, Charles White, who I had gone to uh, Otis to, to be around, well, he didn't live very long. I mean, he, he was dead in 1979. By 79, he was dead. But I spent a lot of time with a, with a painter named Arnold Meshes, who was, who was teaching uh, drawing at, at Otis at the time. And what 
what I learned from him was actually was something that I had been introduced to before I when I was in junior high school by another teacher who was at Otis, which was the thing that made me want to go to school at Otis. And what he had told me was that you would you one of the requirements of being a full-time student at Otis was that you were gonna have to learn how to break down and analyze paintings from the historical record. And so he showed me this sort of process where you sort of do these acetate overlays and you would strip away every element in the picture and try to figure out what contribution each of those elements made to the operation of the whole thing. And so I thought, that's really what I want to know. Because if that's what Leonardo knew, that's what Michelangelo knew, that's what uh, uh, Titian knew, that's what, that, that's what they knew. So if they knew that, then I want to know that too. Because I want to be able to make that kind of picture if I want to. Um, and so with this guy, Sam Clayberg, had showed me that. And Arnold Manchester was the person who actually showed me how to put it into practice. How uh, we'd sit down and we would take a piece of tracing paper and put it over a picture and say, this look, boom, boom, do, shoot, shoot. <laughs> you, know, you go through all of these moves and you say, well, this is why that's this way and that way. And you can think like that through the process of making a work. And to me, that's, that's interesting to do because it's challenging to do. And it's also a way that, it's a way to get yourself out of the habit of doing the same thing over and over and over again, because you can actually apply something, some pressure to what you're doing that would make you do something different. And so I was interested in that. And so when I got tired of doing the abstract work and I was looking around for something that would, would give me that kind of challenge again, this picture was what I settled on. And this is the one where I said, this is the first picture I ever made that made use of everything I learned by diagramming those old master paintings. But it doesn't look like those old master paintings. <laughs> and that was important. Yeah. And it was important that it be done in egg temper too. Sorry about that. No, 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 it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> was, it, was, it was it a simple birth? Or did you have several goes at it? Well, I, you know what? It, it's, not that it's a simple birth, but it was plotted and calculated from the start. So I have a draw. I actually, I still have the, the drawing that I used to transfer this onto the paper that I was working on. But literally, I'm looking at the way in which the the where these shapes exist in the within the frame, how they move either diagonally, vertically, or horizontally. How the arcs, how the wedges, how all of those things. What is there a place where you can fix the shape into a space and lock it there so that it doesn't move? I'm thinking about all that while I'm doing that, so it's really diagrammed. And then, I, 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 this is the first painting where I started to make pictures where I wanted to do a black on a black subject against the black background, and that's where this whole when th this is where the use of black in the figures that I'm doing now. This is where it began. So I started with this idea of being a presence and absence, a kind of simultaneity, having a thing that's there and not there at the same time, but not giving myself the, uh, the easy way out when you're doing a, a, a objects that have this sort of uh, minimal contrast is that you can, you can get away with a lot by doing it. But I wanted all of the underlying structure in the picture to be there, even if you couldn't see it or recognize it in the, in the picture, obviously. I just wanted it all to be there because I would know it was there. And I would think that anybody else who knew how to read pictures would also be able to see it and know that this is, oh, you know, this is not some simple, straight little thing. This is something he worked out. And that was always important to me. It's like it's something that got worked out. It's not something that happened that got worked out. I feel like we could just talk about this picture all night long because it's such an amazing thing. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click on. Um, this is... 10 years later, um, we were talking today about salon hangs, what they call in German as St. Petersburg uh, hanging. And in the 19th century, when there were these great salons in, in, in Paris and France, there was this really strict hierarchy in the salon. The portraits had to go somewhere, the still lives, and the middle was reserved for those great epic history mm -hmm. paintings. Mm -hmm. This feels like your interests, your concerns colliding with that big uh, narrative almost for the first time, making an unashamedly, I mean, it's a history painting. This is, this is a painting of a slave ship which broke the, uh, 
embargo, I guess it was, the mm -hmm. ban, the, mm -hmm. and brought African slaves to America. Um, your, your collage aesthetic is still, you know, it's mm -hmm. still with you, but how, how, how self-conscious was this for you when you're, I mean, the scale of it, mm -hmm. which I think is something really important to talk about. You sort of, you, you've often spoken about wanting to make pictures that people can't ignore, mm -hmm. that, that confront you whether you want, want them to or not. Um, could you talk a little bit about this? Because we've gone from a picture this size to a picture. Yeah, well, um, I mean, one of the things that's obvious when you walk through here, <laughs> there's a lot of big pictures in there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's being painted for churches or for palaces or right, I mean, you know. right. But the thing, but you know, <laughs> when Jackson Pollock first started showing those those big uh, drip paintings, I mean, those were some big pictures too. <clears throat> and some of those uh, Barnett Newman paintings. A pretty big pictures, and those Roscoe's are pretty big pictures too. And they're big pictures probably for some of the same reason that those pictures initially at the church were big pictures too. Because they meant to command attention and to demonstrate a certain kind of awe inspiration uh, over the spectator. I mean, to, 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 to be trans, I mean, in, to be in some way transcendent. Um, and that, I mean, if you take the logic of color field painting, I mean, there isn't anything more transcendent on some level than to be completely enveloped by uh, either an, uh, a, uh, an arrangement of images or a field of color um, where you can't see the edges of it. I mean, there's something about the spectacle of that that is is that has its own power simply because of the scale of it. Now, and you were right to mention that history painting has sort of been a really important touchstone for me, um, almost for some of the same reasons it was sort of central in the academy. I mean, the goal it's it's like as you were talking about the salon. Yeah, it's like what did they? A lot of people did those big big narrative paintings to impress people so they could get more portrait commissions. Because artists always had to make a living. I mean, you got to figure out some kind of way to make some money. But what I was trying to do with a painting like this was to put in everything, to have a picture that had everything going on in it all at once to be controlled and not to be chaotic, but to be controlled in such a way that it gave the same kind of impression that those ordered you know, classical paintings had. But it really was a painting that had everything but the kitchen sink or and the kitchen sink. Um, and it's the kind of, when I was doing these paintings, it's, it seemed like the kind of history painting you could do in the 20th century. Because having, you know, having, so if you, you the way I look at a lot of things, that, since I was born in 1955, if I go back, all of the things that were in play, all of the things that were possible for artists to do by the time I was born in 1955, those things were all available to, me, to, available to me as academic disciplines. So you could go to school and you could learn how to do data, <laughs> you know? You could go to school, you could learn how to do art povera in school. <laughs> And so all of those things, they were equally as academic as going to school and learning how to do a classical painting like an Aang. I mean, it, there was almost no difference. And so because I was familiar with, when I came on the scene, all that stuff was available to me. I saw it all and I liked it all, you know. And so at some point you want to figure out a way to synthesize all of that stuff so it becomes one thing. And that's what I was trying to do in these works. And so when I started making paintings, after I stopped making the collages, and, and part of the reason I stopped making collages was in some ways the same reason I stopped doing the abstract painting because collage is too forgiving. Uh, it lets you get away with a lot. Um, and I didn't want to get away with anything. I wanted to be held to account for myself for every decision that I made in a work. Um, 
And so when I started making these paintings, I wanted to try to make a painting that functioned and operated like a collage without having to do a collage ahead of time as a preparatory study. Because when I was making those collages I was doing, a lot of people used to say, well, you should be using these as the basis of paintings. You should be making paintings from those. But that, to me, that's also not challenging because collage is just too forgiving. So this wouldn't have had any form of preparation? Oh, I mean, you, no. Yeah. I, once I decide on those, suit, on those figures in that boat, then I just go for it. You just go in there, you make all the decisions in the work while you're doing it. Um, because what you're ultimately trying to do is, is to, to achieve a certain kind of balance. Uh, between the materiality of the paint, between the image that's there, between the references that it, it, it makes, surface, all those things. I mean, you really, you're, you're juggling all those things all at once, and you're really trying to make them all cohere so that the thing makes sense. You know, it makes sense as an image that can be read, and then it makes sense as a painting that exists as an object. And so that's what you're really trying to do all the time. So that's, I'm always thinking like that when I'm working on things. We're gonna, um, <coughs> I love these two pictures, but I'm gonna pass by them a little quickly because we're, I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned. This is a painting from 1992 called um, <laughs> Could This Be Love? And it feels like a companion. I don't know if it's- Slow it, dance. Slow yeah. dance, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, 1992, 1993. <laughs> um, the picture I wanted to get to was made the same year as Slow Dance finished, and this is a work called um, Beauty Examined. Um, it's a huge piece, sort of bolted to the wall. Um, it obviously comes laden with uh, ghosts, art historical ghosts, mm -hmm. uh, Mantegna, um, Rembrandt's mm -hmm. anatomy lesson, just anatomy yeah. generally, because mm -hmm. it feels as if this, this, this lady is, I mean, she is being dissected on the table. Um, again, it feels as if the collage aesthetic is extremely apparent here yeah. still. Um, it lingers for a while. <laughs> no, I, but I think the synthesis of it is, is fascinating. I mean, what I wanted to get at with this work is really the sort of um, the major issue in front of us this evening, which is um, you once said, I'm going to read you something you said, which is always a horrible thing to do to someone. <laughs> um, you once said, it was, in pictures, it was in pictures that I saw a world that looked completely different from the world outside my door. Mm -hmm. This may sound like a dumb question, but at what point, I mean, at what point did it become apparent to you that people of African descent were entirely absent from what you were looking at, and was this, at what point did that become uh, something for you to wrestle with? Was that right from the get-go? Or I sort of feel that there's a moment where you're around this time where it sort of becomes more, um, <sighs> Well, but this, this is late. I mean, in that, in that process. It is? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's, this, it's coming to terms with the history of art as we know it and as we are introduced to it, not only through museums, but through art history books of all, of all kinds. So if you take any of the books, the Janssen books, you take the Arnheim books, I mean, you take all of those books, I mean, you wouldn't find a single black person who made a picture. <laughs> and so you get, you go to the museum and you, the impression that a black person never painted a picture in the entire 600 years of painting history that these museums contain. So when you go to the museum, that becomes obvious. It's like it's apparent right off the bat. And when I was on that field trip at the LA County, it was apparent right off the bat. <laughs> that I, not only did I not see a picture of a black person in there, I didn't see a picture that was by a black person. That's what I was gonna say, there. because those so. are two equally problematic situations. You know, it's not just the absence of black artists, it's also the portrayal of yeah. figures of African descent in museums. See, but museums. that only becomes, that, that's so, but that's not problematic for the people who are making those pictures because they were making the pictures for a clientele that asked for them. So it's not their problem. It was a problem for me if I want to see myself there to do something about it. 
Either I can say, well, you should have made those pictures of me too, or I can say, well, I want to make pictures that match the power of these pictures so I can be up there too. So that was the approach I took, you know, because there is nothing, I mean, I did, it's, it's, I enjoyed myself every time I go to the museum. And every time I come here, I see things that I love. You know, I really see things that I love. And I would come here again and again and again to see them. So the problem is not that the absence of works by black people in that tradition was something that shouldn't have taken place, because that wasn't a tradition that Africans were a part of. I was just going to say, because <laughs> You know, if we're going to sit here and try and uh, uh, make a diagnosis of an institution like this and proclaim a, uh, a cure, we can't just magic up um, 2,000 years of women artists because women were not given a paintbrush for centuries and centuries and centuries. So, yes, we do present, and when I say we, it's Prado, National Gallery, Hermitage. We're all kind of all in this together. We present a side of something which is sorely lacking everything. Well, but the thing is that, but, but you look at what was driving it. Why do people make pictures in the first place? You know, it, it, so Cecil Taylor, who, who just died recently, I don't, I don't know how many people know Cecil Taylor, who's a, I, I don't know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't say he was a jazz pianist. He is a kind of an avant-garde, uh, pianist, percussionist, performer. But he died. I, there was an I, in an interview with him once, he was asked if he was upset that other people were getting credit for innovations in music that he didn't get recognized for that he had done 30, 40 years before then. And his response to it said, why would I be upset? He said, nobody asked me to do this. Nobody asked me to do this. I'm doing this because this is what I think I need to do and this is what I want to do, but nobody asked me to do this. So whether I'm, it's, it's, I, there's nothing to be upset about. And so in a way, it's that same thing. So my way of looking at it, and this is why I think it was important for me to have started out with John Nagy, <laughs> where if I thought, if I thought the, the, the value in art rested on my capacity to express myself in a way that people could be receptive to, then I would be in a world of trouble. Because, it would, because that position requires a sympathetic viewer who is sensitive enough to recognize something in you that connects to something in them. <laughs> but if you think that making art is about certain kinds of ideas about the nature of the thing, well then, it's like you, you, you're not, you, you, you don't get wounded so deeply when people don't respond to what you do because it's not you personally that's being rejected. I mean, if it's about self-expression, then anything that's not accepted is you being rejected personally. <laughs> and there's almost nothing you can do to guard against that because you can't be liked by everybody. <laughs> but if it's about a conversation about ideas and that ideas connect with the history of other ideas that are like it, then that's something you can participate in. And on the strength of the ideas you project, you can make an argument about what you, and you can judge whether people actually recognize what you're doing, with, with what you've done or not. Adrian Piper does it all the time. Anybody gets something wrong about Adrian Piper, she's writing a letter. <laughs> and she'll point out to you exactly how you didn't understand what it was she was trying to do. And she can give you the ideas and the references and all that stuff. She does it all the time. <laughs> That's something you can do something about, but you can't do anything about whether people accept you on an emotional level or some sort of spiritual level or some whatever that deep personal thing that you're supposed to be conveying through your work. You can't do anything about that. And so you, it, it, it's dangerous to hang your well-being <laughs> on something like that. So it's much, it's just, plus it's much more challenging to deal with 
to deal with the way people have thought about things um, over time. So that's just the way I, I've approached it. And so this, I, so this whole thing, so a couple of things happened that made, that made it clear that there was a need for, uh, for me to address this absence of black representation and black participation. Um, one was in 1966, and this is, this is timely because the, you know, in 1966, Marvel Comics introduced the Black Panther as a character into Fantastic Four number 52. <laughs> Before that character appeared in that comic book, you never asked the question, where were the black superheroes? You never asked it because you just simply assumed that a, black, that a superhero was a white guy with a square jaw. It was Batman, it was Superman, it was The Flash, it was Aquaman, it was Hawkman. That's what you thought a superhero was supposed to be because that's what, he, what superheroes were. As soon as you put a black, the Black Panther in a comic book, all of a sudden people start asking, well, what, wait a minute. I never saw another black superhero. That's, it's like the moment you're introduced to a thing, that's when it starts to become a problem. And either you can do something about it or you can wait around for somebody else who th you think is supposed to do something about it. But I chose to do something about it myself. Um, because so the, on the, the other side of that was this, this man that I just mentioned, Charles White, who is uh, having a retrospective show that's opening at the Art Institute of Chicago in June. It'll travel to the Museum of Modern Art in October. But that was the man, I mean, I, I wanted to be around that man every minute of the day if I could. I hung around him every chance I got. It was the reason why I chose the Otis Art Institute as a school I wanted to go to. Because that was the first time I'd seen a black man do something that was masterful. With the kind of power and at the scale that he was doing it, I'd never seen it done like that. Remarkable. But when I never saw Charles White's work show up in an art history book, I thought, well, what's up with that? What's up with that? Is there something wrong with the work he's doing or is there something wrong with the perception of the people who are looking at it? And so you have to ask, you have to answer that question. And if you find that there are any deficiencies in the work that he's doing, you have to figure out how to resolve those deficiencies. If you think it's in the perception of the people who are, 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 are judging and selecting the work, then you have to do something about that too, which is open the studio museum in Harlem, <laughs> you know? open a museum and make a case for the work like the people who are running the other museums are making a case for the work that's in there. Do that too, and if you can't do that, then there's something deficient in you. <laughs> that means you can't compete on the level of ideas, that you can't project your ideas into the world as forcefully as other people are doing it. That's how, to me, that's, the, that's, what, makes the, that's what makes living exciting. <laughs> that's what makes the world interesting. It's how do I get in there and compete at the same level that everybody else is operating at, do the same kinds of things, and project my, my ideal of the world into the, into the space with the kind of force that makes it unavoidable. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> we I'm, get stuck I'm, on I'm, I'm beginning to wish that your picture here could just stay with us forever, <laughs> because I... I well, um, I could do this on any picture. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, <I'm just laughs> but I won't. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, where are we going to go so now? Let, no, yeah. let's, let's, what's after yeah, this? let's do this. What's after this? Uh, Lost Boys. Oh, so those two pictures. Yeah. You can toggle back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll let you go on this. <laughs> so, I mean, this is also a wonderful moment because it's, this was, acquired by Los Angeles by County the, Museum of Art. LA County Art Museum. So this was the thing, when I made this, so this picture and the next picture. So, I mean, every artist goes through, a, a, you go through a period of development where you're simply trying to figure out how to do the thing you want to do. You're not really, I, I always told my students when I, when I was teaching, I said, you don't make art when you're in school. You do exercises when you're in school. And everything you do in school is an exercise, it's not art. But when you get out, so 
you, you, you try to figure out how to make use of the things you experienced while you're in school, how to make those things meaningful for you, and then how to, how to, how to create a sustainable uh, studio practice that can keep you going into your old age. So this picture of the Lost Boys and the previous picture uh, called This Style, I made those pictures after I had been at the Studio Museum, I had gotten to Chicago, and when I made both those pictures, and I stood back, I said, these are the pictures I had always imagined myself being able to make. Everything I had done was so that I could make, to get to a point where I could make those two pictures. Because to me, those pictures had, they were, they were hitting on all cylinders, if you will. Everything that I knew, I put into those pictures. They were rich for me at every level, the surface, the structure, the, uh, you know, the imagery, all of that stuff, chromatically. I mean, they were more sophisticated than anything I had seen anybody else do. <laughs> I don't have a problem claiming to know something about color. <laughs> So, in, but, but the thing is that, but you hit a moment like this and you say, yes, yes, yes. That's what I had always been, that's what I've been working for. That's what I've been trying to do all my life. I've been trying to get to a place where I can make a picture like that and then make it again and make it again and make it again and make it again because now I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and those are the two pictures that I reached a plateau with those two pictures. And I said, yes, I have arrived. And not only was it important that I made those two pictures, but that first one, the DeStyle painting, was the first painting that was ever acquired by a major museum. And it was acquired by the LA County Art Museum, which was the first museum I ever went into. And that was a big deal for me. So that meant something. So that was to me, and, it, and on top of it, those paintings were 10 foot, by, 10 foot by 11 foot. So it was on a scale. And when you walked into that gallery, you couldn't walk through that room. And, and as Chuck Close used to say, I didn't want people to come into the museum and say, was there a Chuck Close in there? <laughs> <laughs> you go in there, you can't miss them. <laughs> where, where does this one live? Well, this one now is somewhere in uh, Amst I, Where? I don't know. Uh, it what had for a time, it was in Amsterdam. But for the longest time, it was with the, the uh, principal financial group in Des Moines, Iowa. Okay. <laughs> they bought that picture back in the 90s. Then they sold it. So they, they were a huge step for you. In they were. In terms of, <clears throat> sorry, go on. Oh, no. no, but no, no. In terms of public exposure, this was a huge, this, this group of five paintings was a was huge a break, deal for yeah, you. Yeah, a turning point, yeah. But that's, so, but here's the thing. And so this is where when you, when you hit this, when you hit these plateaus sometimes, literally everything I did after that, I mean, to the degree that you could make the claim that it was mistake free, everything I did after those two pictures was mistake free. <laughs> and, and, and I don't mean that, it, that there's no process involved in making pictures. There are no changes of mind, that there are no decisions that get changed. But, but there's a different way, of, there's a, you, you, you go through the work in a different way after you reach a certain kind of plateau, where you, you're, there's a certain kind of sureness about the choices you make. Um, and it's like you, you, you're, you're no longer fumbling around to figure out and you're, not, you're no longer relying on chance to get at what you want. And in these pictures, I always get what I want. I never start a picture that doesn't turn out the way I want it to turn out. And to me, that's my, uh, that's, that's, that's what I've been trying to get to. I don't ever, I don't, I'm, I, can start, I, can, I can start a picture with a blindfold on and then I can, take it off and then I can make it come out the way I wanted it to come out. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. You want, to, you want to be at a place where everything you do works the way you want it to work. So you're about close to 40 when you made those two pictures that we just looked at. Well, let's see, that was, if it was 93. 93. 
So in 95, I would have turned 40, so I was 30, yeah. 37. Th 37, 38. Yeah, 30. I mean, I sort of feel, we've got a lot of very young artists in the room tonight, a lot of mm -hmm. students. I sort of feel that there's a tremendous pressure on young artists emerging from the schools now that they have to emerge with a voice and develop a voice quite quickly. But it's extremely comforting to hear that you're going at this. I mean, you're making some fantastic works before then, but that's when you feel that you're, the fog kind of lifts a little bit and you're really hitting your stride. Mm -hmm. um, just to give everyone a bit of breathing space in terms of uh, the work they're making themselves. Um, yeah, but the thing they also, I mean, there are a couple of, a couple of situations when I was in school, so the, the art world that exists now didn't exist quite the way it does today. So, I mean, I went to school, literally, was, was the tail end of the era when people thought, well, you know, artists don't make work because they intend to make any money selling work. That it was, it was almost like a heresy to, to make artwork because you wanted to sell them. Um, because I, so I started, so in, I started school at Otis in 1977. And I mean, in, in the years from 1977 in the academy, there was a lot at stake. I mean, so there were almost fist fights between groups of artists. Because, you know, conceptual art was really sort of taken over in the academy in the mid-70s. And Otis was no different than any of the other places where that might have been happening. And there were a lot of artists in a department at Otis. They used to, they used to call it intermedia back then, which that's where you did video, you did performance, you did installation, you did conceptual work. You did all that in the intermedia department. And when I started school, when I finally got to school at Otis in 1977, they were, though, they, not only the faculty, but the student body was actively trying to get rid of everybody who taught something like drawing and painting and sculpture and stuff like that. They wanted those people out of there. And so there were a group of students who were graduate students who were running the student gallery. They wouldn't let you show any work in there if you were making a painting. But I thought that was, I, my, my position was, I mean, it, and this may sound off, <laughs> but I was hanging out with a lot of those graduate students, and I didn't think they knew, <laughs> they didn't seem to know a whole lot about anything, much less what the right thing to do for making art was gonna be. And the things, that, and the moves they were making and the strategies they were using seemed, you could adopt those things at any time. But it took a long time to figure out how to make a good painting. <laughs> it took a long time. And I had come to this conclusion that it's like the, the Academy, because conceptual art came into play, the Academy then stopped producing hacks after Adolf Bouguereau died. <laughs> the Academy has been producing hack artists ever since. But to figure out how to not be amongst that group of people who are simply doing, following the trends of the day and doing what everybody else is doing just because everybody else seems to be doing it or it seems to be the popular thing in the moment, that the thing, to figure out how to not be a part of that group is the goal that people who are in school should be addressing. And the only way you can address that is to, is to believe that knowing something about the history of art and why people make the decisions they do matters. That's the only, re the only way to avoid that. So this is, this is a, group of fi it's a group of five paintings, um, all um, housing projects in Los Angeles, Chicago, Chicago well, and Los Angeles. one in Los Angeles and the rest in Chicago. Um, well, that's this not, is that's the one in, where you live. That's where we lived in the Nixon, moved. right, yeah. Nixon and, Gardens. And I've put this picture in just for fun, but you're, you're, you're heading in this kind of pastoral tradition. That's, yeah, that's what all of the, 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 the garden, uh, garden project was what those paintings were called. And I, I just simply selected all of the housing projects in Chicago that had garden as a part of their name. And then tried to, to, to use that title, that name, <clears throat> to, to say something about how we don't tend to think of these kinds of institutional places as 
pass through garden spots. But how at, at a certain moment in history when these places were first opening, like when we first moved into Nickerson Gardens, I mean, they really were. <laughs> I mean, they really were ideal. I mean, everybody wanted to get in there. It was a utopia. It was almost. I mean, it was about as close as you were going to get uh, to a kind of utopian living environment on the kind of income that you had to have in order to get in those apartments, you know. And so that field, we, our, our apartment was just to the, to the right of that field where those kids are standing, but to the left was the gymnasium. And in that gymnasium, I mean, that was, it's like, you couldn't want any more than what was offered there at the time. I mean, not only in terms of what they had in facilities, but what, in terms of the things they made available to, to residents in the projects. I, and I, I tell everybody, they used to have a toy library in that gymnasium where you could go and check out for a week at a time all the latest toys. <laughs> all you had to do was give them your address, you take it, in for, take, it in, take it home for a week and bring it back, you get out, get two or three more. <laughs> I mean, what could be better than that? For a kid especially, what could be better than that? <laughs> and when you're painting these 30 uh, something years later, it's at a time when everyone is actually discussing. Oh, they're trying to tear them down. Right. Because they think there's something wrong with the projects that causes people who live in there to be out of whack. <laughs> so, they, so in Chicago, uh, all, of the, all of those houses, those housing projects from, Rob, from Stateway Gardens to Robert Taylor Homes, all of them are gone, they're torn down. <laughs> but the problem is it wasn't the projects, it wasn't the structures that were the problem. It was the economy, it was the absence of an economy around the projects that could sustain the people who lived in there. That was where the problem was. But they tore the buildings down. <laughs> and you showed these works for the first time um, at Documenta 10 in, your, in uh, Castle in 1997. What was the response to them in, at the time when they were first shown? Um, well, I mean, they got chosen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Catherine David was, did that documenta. And, I, and oddly enough, so here's the thing, this will come full circle and the, the, the commander will, will appreciate this when I say it. <laughs> so this is so, at, the, at that document, and I, I, was, I was walking through, you know, walking around like everybody else, and, so I, and I ran into to somebody who stopped me and said, you know what, I, I, like, I kinda like those paintings you, you had over there. It was Benjamin Buclot, <laughs> who was the last person I thought I would be getting uh, a, a compliment for. And, but it was, and the thing was, it was a kind of backhanded compliment in a way. Because he started out, the first thing he said was, you probably don't have, he said, you probably don't know who I am. <laughs> and oddly enough, the only reason I knew who he was, because I had gone, he had done a, a lecture at Cooper Union on Hans Hacker in New York, and I had gone to his lecture on Hans Hacker. And so I knew who he was. That was my first trip out into a big international exhibition in that documenta. But he said, he said, you probably don't know who I am. Uh, you probably don't have any reason to know who I am, was what he said. I said, well, of course, I know who you are. <laughs> and I told him about the, the lecture and stuff like that, but he said, but I, I like those paintings. <laughs> so that felt good to me. <laughs> There's one thing I want to talk to you about these pictures. We talked briefly today about humor. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something I don't feel that I read enough about humor when I read people writing about your work, not as if they're laden with humor, but I feel that, I feel that you juggle a lot of emotions in works like this. There's um, anger, there's some irony, there's some regret, there's some uh, pathos, but there's something hopeful, and there's something fortunate, and there's something romantic, and there's a yearning. Mm -hmm. How, is it, is it, a and there's a sense of humor. I mean, I think the humor comes actually in something like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a very serious message in a painting. This is a painting called Past Times from 97. There's a very serious message in here, but there's, I feel that there is a sense of humor in your work. Is, is, that, is that something that you 
seek? What? Is that an inappropriate reading? No, no, not, not, not wholly inappropriate. I mean, in, in a way, I mean, if you, if you take the overview of the works that I, I've made, I mean, if you look at everything, um, I mean, I, it's, it's like I moved through the, the way I moved through the world and engaged with history, I think I, 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 I do it with a fairly light touch. Um, and so there's a kind of, there's a natural irony in the works I do, but they're never ironic. Right. It's not a posture, it's not a pose. Right. There's a way in which you can see the world in which the irony of the way things unfold and the, the way things kind of interact. It just, I mean, it's just, that's just sort of the way it is. Um, and so I see the world like that. And I, so I see, I mean, there, <laughs> my wife and I do this all the time. So we, we share pictures with each other periodically because you know, when we're driving around the neighborhood you know, or, or in other places in Chicago, we take pictures of interesting things we see and we sort of shoot them to each other. You know, partly because we know it's, it's, it's going to bring a, you know, either, a, a, if not just a chuckle, <laughs> at least put a, a bring a smile. Because we recognize there's a certain kind of, uh, uh, I, I don't know how to describe this, I mean, there's a tragicomic kind of, it's, it's seeing the world on a, all the time as a tra and, and being in the world as a sort of tragicomic drama, where all it's, it's like every dimension of your your emotional life is being uh, uh, pricked or put into play or, or aroused or or addressed all the time. It's like you, I see something that will, in the neighborhood that would make me cry, and then I go around the corner and I'm cracking up because there's something around there that just seems so outrageous. I mean, that's you can you can live in the world like this, and since you you were talking about about being in coming from Birmingham, going to California, and some of the things we experienced. So here's something that I think, <clears throat> uh, apart from the horror movies I grew up loving. And I, I love horror movies and science fiction films. But then, so the Watts riots, the Watts riots in 1965. So I remember, so that, that evening as the, 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 the riots were going on and, you know, the business district was on fire in South Central, you know, and my parents had gotten together with some other friends of ours from Birmingham, of theirs from Birmingham, and we all, we all met up over at one of my parents' friends' houses, which was just, which was a, a block away from Central Avenue. And the thing is, so we were over there kind of wait, listening to the news and waiting out the whole, whole thing. Uh, but I was, and they had a two-story house, and upstairs, I was looking out the window towards Central Avenue, and on, on the corner of Vernon Avenue and Central Avenue was a jack-in-the-box fast food taco place. And they used to have this, uh, uh, they used to have a jack-in-the-box clown on a, high up on a pole that used to be lit up and it was rotating. And that night, I was looking out the window at Central Avenue, and it's like every, all the lights were out. It was completely black. And against a wall of flames was that stupid jack-in-the-box clown <laughs> turning around on the top of that pole. And I looked at that and I said, I got to make a picture about that. Because it, was, it, it seemed to encapsulate the whole thing. It's like it was this crazy moment where it, what seemed that during the day, what seemed to be a kind of carnivalesque atmosphere, you know, with people running around and, and smashing windows and throwing Molotov cocktails and burning places up. That was going on during the day, but then at night, 
when the National Guard came out and the police were shooting and like everything was going kind of haywire and there was a curfew, nobody's supposed to be on the street. But looking out and seeing that clown, sent to me to encapsulate the whole thing, and especially when the next day you woke up, you went out, and there was no longer a grocery store on the corner of your block. There was no longer a shopping district on Central Avenue where you used to go. None of that stuff you used to be able to go to was there anymore, and it took decades for most of that stuff to come back. So you really sort of saw <laughs> that whatever the motivation for the riot was, the destruction that followed had a lingering and a lasting impact that none of the people who were participating in it could have, maybe they didn't anticipate, but for the people who weren't, Participants, the impact was tremendous, was devastating. So now you got to get in the car and you got to drive miles to go to a grocery store now. So that jack in the box thing, to me, that, that shaped my, that helped shape my perception of things. So it's like you never know what I understood at that moment is that you, you never know the underlying motivation for anything that happens in the world. What you're only seeing is a fragment of what the reality is, and you can't make a lot of decisions based on that fragment of reality you just experienced. So you gotta, so things take time <laughs> to really come, so for you to understand. And so this is why I make art like I make it because of that too. So things take time, and the more contact you have with the work you're making, gives it a chance to season the thing, you know, because you gotta think through it. I mean, if, if you're doing things you don't have to think through, I don't know what you can be putting in. I don't know what you can come out, what you can get out of it. I, I just don't know. I've got one eye on the clock, so I'm going to skip <laughs> forward a little bit. Uh, there was a couple of things I wanted to talk about, but we'll, we'll do them another time. This is a, a wonderful painting called Gulfstream from 2003. Um, 7 a.m. Sunday morning. 7 a.m. Sunday morning from the same year. Um, this wonderful picture, another work from the same series, landed on the cover of Art Forum last year during your traveling, uh, traveling show. I wanted to get to this picture. Mm -hmm. I, I read that y this is a wonderful picture called uh, School of Beauty. School of Culture. School of Culture. And you always intended this to sort of bookend or be a companion to the style, the barbershop. Right. But it took you about 20 years. It took a while. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why? Why did it take you 20 years to make this picture? Because it's an extraordinary picture. I mean, did you literally, did you know exactly what you wanted to do? Well, I was going to make those, I, I was actually going to make those two paintings at, at about the same time. And so the thing is, so this is based, uh, it, it's, it's based on, if you go back to the 7 a.m. Sunday morning painting, that, that place right there, that, on the, on the audience's left. That is the School of Beauty, School of Culture. That's what that is, it's a beauty school. <laughs> they teach classes in there. And you can, you can get the scholarships and you get credit, you can, you can do and get your cosmetology license by going to school there. So that's around, that was my studio was down the street from there. So I was, I was gonna do the barbershop and that at the same time, but I got, but other things happened and I ended up doing a lot of other pictures in between, but I always intended to come back and do this picture. And this now lives in, and so this, in, Birmingham. in Birmingham, at the Birmingham Museum. And uh, you know, I got a, I got a, a, a text and a, a, an email from a curator in Birmingham once that some people came into the museum and did a gorilla wedding in front of that painting. <laughs> Two, right, there was a man and a woman. She was a, a beautician and he was a barber. They were hairdressers. They came in, they, had, they brought a minister. <laughs> they snuck into the museum and they went up and they, got, they did their vows in front of that picture. <laughs> I think that's an amazing idea. It, Galleries yeah. are open till nine o'clock tonight. So, <laughs> um, but, but, the thing, but, I mean, the, so if you look at that painting and you look at the, the style painting, though, I, what I hope is, is apparent is that there was some development over that time and that this picture is more complex than the, the, than the style painting. And, it, and I, I think it is. <laughs> um, but it also, is, you know, this is in some ways my, my homage to Holbein. You know, and if you take that, the, the ambassador's painting with that anamorphic skull in the, in the bottom. But it was, it's like, 
I mean, you can do that, you can use a device like that in a way that it becomes a kind of a gimmick, or you can use it at a moment when it seems perfectly appropriate for the subject and for the intent of the painting. And I think in this case, the image that is, is done in an anamorphic form is perfect for this idea, for the whole idea of what Be School of Beauty, School of Culture represents. Um, I think what's interesting when you think back to the barbershop, what the difference for me 20, feels, 20 years later feels that the, um, the collage aspect or the sort of magpie aspect mm -hmm. and the painterly aspect have synthesized here. It's sort of locked into place. It had a rawness to it before, yeah. which we love and is fascinating, but here this feels, it feels as if there's a sort of more democratic surface somehow than, you know. Yeah, I, you know, and the thing is what I've been over time is, is on some level, uh, systematically eliminating um, a whole uh, toolbox of devices that kind of come out of modernist painting. You know, so it's like you don't see that, that, that you no longer the drips, no longer the smears, no longer the, you know, things out of phase. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's less and less and less and less of that happening in the work I'm doing now. So that I'm, I'm again, more, I get more and more and more and more interested in precision, in a certain kind of precision. Um, and that's what I think, you know, this picture, I mean, there are decorative elements that are, that, that are consistent on some level with the collage aesthetic, sure. like the, the glitter and uh, stuff like that. Even the uh, Chris Afili poster and the Lauren Hill poster and the, you know, this. Yeah, but those things are, those things are, 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 so everything is painted in. I mean, it's like, yeah. Composition, you know, I, I, you know, this is, I think over time what I really, composition is king when it comes to making pictures. It's like, and, the, the, and it's, it's fun to do. I mean, it really is fun to build a picture like a carpenter. So I, I really understand how, what, what Duchamp meant about Surratt. And I love Surratt's work also because of that. And if you, if you think about some of the things Surratt had to say about his paintings, well, you, you would love it even more, at least, if so you were somebody like me. Because it's like there's something about building pictures that and I always said, it's like, why, what's, what's the difference really between being an artist and being a particle physicist? What is really the difference? Aren't the objectives the same? Don't you want to first understand the building blocks of matter? And then once you understand that, figure out how do you construct matter from the building blocks? I mean, isn't that what physicists do? <laughs> and painters, I think, do the same thing. I mean, you want to know paint. You want to know the space that paint operates in, and then you want to figure out how to get the most out of that paint and that space and those objects and that color. You want to figure out how to get the most out of those things you can. So here, let me go to one something that may, that may seem incon incongruent, but it's not. And so Robert Irwin did a, a great lecture at UIC when I was teaching there, and it was when he was doing that garden at the Getty Center in Malibu. And I mean, the, the, the stories he told about his life and how he arrived at do, what he was doing in that garden. But the thing that he said that was the most important is that every single thing that happens in that garden was something that was plotted out, calculated, and decided upon ahead of time. He said, I went up to North Dakota and I handpicked 300 glacial boulders to put in that place. He said, every plant that's there is there because I like it was for the green. The flowers that it presents is a bonus. There are things that are not going to reach their maturity in that garden for 10 years, but I'm putting them in there because I know what the effect is going to be 10 years from now. Now, it's like the kind of control that he exercised over stu structuring that garden, that's exactly what, to me, that's what it's really all about. And especially given what I said earlier, that when I was born in 1955, everything that an artist could do was already in play. 
So you're simply choosing from a menu of possibilities and trying to make the most of what you can use those possibilities for. We're not really trying, we're not really, we're not actually inventing anything when it comes to making pictures anymore. But there are ways in which those devices can be deployed in the ways that things might be synthesized that haven't quite been configured that way before. We can do that. But if you look back on the history of human beings and the kinds of things human beings have made since human beings walked upright, I mean, <laughs> there's some pretty remarkable stuff. <laughs> People did some remarkable stuff. And they didn't have universities. I mean, I wanted to talk about this lovely lady, but I'm going to skip over her. And just, no, don't and, skip over and, this. Well, I'll talk about I got to say something. Oh, you have? I got to okay. say something okay. about that. Okay. <laughs> and it, I'll be brief. No, go for it. I mean, you've come a long way. I've got all night. Uh, if anyone needs to go to dinner, run off. But uh, well, no, let's go. I, let's this, go. This, this is anecdote. This is a funny. This is an anecdote. So I have to, and I have to say it. We have to give a shout out to Mr. Barnes. And Mr. Barnes, V.L. Barnes was his name, was, my, was our, our yard man. He cut my grass at the house, at the studio. He cut my mother-in-law's grass. He cut Cheryl's aunt's grass. So he was our yard man. So he, when I got the studio I'm in now, so he used to do the yard there too. So I was, I, this painting was in the, the first show I had at David Verner Gallery in London. So, on, but on the eve of getting ready to, to send the work out for the show, Mr. Barnes and the his crew wanted to come in and see the work before it went out. <laughs> and he came, I, I had them, they came in, they came to look at the stuff. And he came, Mr. Barnes was, Mr. Barnes was 70, about 72, 73 or so at the time. When he saw this picture, he said, Mrs. Barnes said, she's so cute. <laughs> she's talking to me. <laughs> and I said, that, I felt satisfied. <laughs> I felt, I said, the show's gonna be a success. Mr. Barnes said so. <laughs> so anyway, that's the only thing I wanted to say about that. And, <laughs> and I was gonna come up with some art historian thing about the gays and stuff, but that was a way, way nicer, <laughs> way nicer way into the picture. We'll leave the gays for another, another day. Um, now, we're gonna finish here. Um, you did tell me when we walked through today that had you known that Vermeer was free, he may well have been the uh, subject of your attention for the last few months. But we gave you an invitation. Uh, we said, choose a room, choose an artist, choose a painting. And you, you, you honed in pretty quickly on this remarkable painting by Tintoretto, Susanna and the Elders. I think you said, this is what's left. These are what's oh, left. Oh, I, I remember. I mean, <laughs> Carrie, I Carrie. I, 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 I don't think, I, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> This, this is being recorded. Yeah. Um, I might have said there were a few rooms which were not. Um, did I say that? So, something like in that, that list may have been Caravaggio, Tintoretto, Raphael. So, yeah. I think it was so, a pretty good list of right, names. For me, it wasn't yeah. even on the it list. It wasn't like, so you know, the second rate Dutch old masters. Um, <laughs> all right, you put me in my place. Um, <laughs> To, to, to talk so, a little bit about this, but how did it, I mean, we, we sat in front of this picture for, for 10 or 15 beautiful minutes today. How did you approach this idea? You, I, mean, I, I need you to sort of slightly go over the ground that you went over today, but <laughs> the change of format straight away, the change of the power dynamics in the picture. Well, no, I mean, the, I mean it's not like uh, Tenoretto is some consolation prize you get to work with Tenoretto. <laughs> it's not like I was saying that. Because that's still, that, that Tenoretto painting is what, so there are four paintings in this museum that I would come into. I would come in and look at those four paintings and nothing else and be satisfied anytime I came to Vienna. That Tenoretto painting is one of them, that Susanna thing. It is a beautiful painting. That painting, the Vermeer, the self-portrait in the studio, allegory of painting. That is the Correggio painting, that Jupiter and Eo painting. And then we were looking at some Bruegels and stuff in there today. I mean, th this place is loaded with stuff that's just, <laughs> I mean, really, it's like, it's like, you, you, I mean, at some point, you have to do a pilgrimage to places because you need to see those things in person. And this would be one of those places like Vienna, 
would be one of those places where in your lifetime you would want to do a pilgrimage to because there's some things you just got to see and you got to see them in person. Uh, the Klimt stuff, too, we were just we were looking at those Klimt murals. I mean, it's just amazing. So I wasn't unhappy <laughs> that the Tenoretto was the painting that was there because I like it. And so trying to figure out, so we, yeah, we were talking about, uh, a, I mean, the, first of all, the, the, so I didn't, even, I didn't know what the whole list of people who were going to be in the show was. The only other artist I knew who was going to be, who was doing the work was Peter Doy. I mean, he's the only person you mentioned uh, <laughs> who was doing another work. I didn't know, and I think I'm I feeling found... like my communication with you is, is kind of <laughs> unfriendly. And I thought I was kind of polite and English, but obviously not. Um, I'm going to go back and reread all those messages. <laughs> yeah, go back and look at. No, this. I said that someone else was making a new work for the show. Well, you said and Peter Doyle. Yeah, was I did. A new but work that was the, the only other one who made a new work for the show. <laughs> but um, anyway, so um, but no, so now the. I mean, anytime you 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 try to make a work that's in response to another work, an existing work that has the kind of. Uh, Stat status that the Tenoretto painting has, I mean, it, it can be intimidating to even approach. Um, but for me, I mean, the chance to show a work in this museum um, was just, it's one of those once in a life, it seemed like a li once in a lifetime kind of moment. Um, and so then the challenge is, you can, I, can you arise to the occasion? You know, can you produce something that doesn't embarrass you? Because it's like the glow from that Tenoretto painting <laughs> you know, extends pretty wide. <laughs> you know, and if you get caught in the shadow of that thing, you could look pretty bad. Um, and, so I, and so given, you know, given you know, who I am and, and this, what I do and the subjects I choose uh, and my interest in, in art history, you know, I had to sort of start to figure out what approach I would take. And I mean, it, fairly early, I, I knew I didn't want to tell the same story, that I wanted to figure out some kind of way to make the story be in the moment in, in our moment, um, and that I didn't want to displace the, uh, the, 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 the problematic uh, implications of looking on the subjects that were also in the picture. <clears throat> because even in the Tenoretto painting, as we were, we were talking about it around there, I mean, the, the real spectator, the real voyeur in the painting is us always, too, because the way Susanna, Susanna is presented uh, for the spectator who's looking at the picture, um, she's the object of our desire more than I think she is really in the picture, the object of the old men's desire. And so one of the things in the history of painting, one of the things that I have to wrestle with is the way in which the black female body is almost never the object of that kind of mythological, romantic desire. But at the same time, I don't want to present <laughs> the black female body in that same position of vulnerability. Because I'm not, I, I, I can't duplicate the same kind of uh, objectification that Tintoretto was displaying. I can't do that. Because that just wouldn't, that doesn't sit well with me to make an image that does exactly what that image does. And so I have to figure out a way to get a little bit of all of the things that I want and a little bit of what I think the spectators would, would, uh, would like to see 
So in, in, in a lot of the works I do, especially uh, a work like this, there's always a, a little bit of refusal, uh, a, a little bit of refusal to go along with the story, you know, to, to, to be completely invested, to go all the way. And so, which is the reason why she's, yes, she's just come out of the shower, but she's got her underwear on, you know. She's, uh, so that's the, the bath, you know, so the dress she's trying out because she's ready, she's making herself attractive and available for somebody that she's chosen, <laughs> you know, but from across the way, you know, we as spectators, we can assume there's a spectator in between us and the subject, but we are all ultimately uh, the, 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 the uh, we are ultimately the, the primary voyeur in, in a picture like this. But, it, but, but the, the, the kind of waiting and the kind of anticipation, the, the fact that she's in the process of be, getting dressed means that we have a limited window <laughs> to, to be satisfied with that voyeuristic experience. And so that's, those are the things I was starting to think about when I started to put together the picture. So how was I going to do it? Of course, you know, my wife would come into the studio from time to time and she said, put some clothes on that woman. <laughs> but I was, I was always going to put the underwear on, but I, there's, there's a certain amount of stuff you have to do before you get to that part. <laughs> but she would always say, come and put some clothes on her. Why is she in that naked place? I, um, I am conscious that the galleries are open till nine o'clock, and I want everyone to see this picture who hasn't seen it, so I'm going to wrap this up. I hear two things. I, I walk through this exhibition every couple of days with people, and I hear two things from everyone when I stand in front of your painting. One is, he looks like he has fun when he paints, which is something that you talked about tonight, which I think is you know, about that control, but having fun once you have that control yeah. and knowing what you're doing. Everyone says, this looks like someone who enjoys painting. And secondly, everybody says, this picture has to stay here forever. <laughs> Everyone says it. I'm like, well, talk. Really? Talk, you know. <laughs> so, and, and, and more, and much more importantly in the context of what we, much more importantly in, in, in terms of the context of what we, this picture belongs here. Oh, really? And that belonging is a different <laughs> thing. But so we'll have to talk well, to Angela about that. But belonging, <laughs> you know. But that's, um, you know, but you know what? All, and the thing is, uh, I, I really, I mean, what I said earlier was, was true. I mean, you don't want to embarrass yourself in this context. This is a once in a lifetime kind of opportunity. I mean, it's not every day that you get to be associated with artists that you admire from the historical record. I mean, so this is the second time, because I, I said, I had a work in, in a show at the Metropolitan that was called Unfinished. And it was a work of, about the various ways in which artists either left work unfinished or used the unfinished quality of a work as the kind of, uh, as, as the point of the, the piece. And so, and I had said in my, in the, um, in, in some comments I made at the opening of that show, this, finally, I finally, finally managed to get myself in a show with Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> well. And so now I'm in a show in Vienna with Tintoretto, and then with Vermeer in another room, with Rubens, with Van der Waal, with Goya, with Velasquez. I'm in a room with all, I'm in a show with all those people now. <laughs> I think you imagined the Goya today, but oh, I wish we I had a Goya. a Goya. I wish we had a Goya here. Was that just Velasquez looking like Goya? It was just Velasquez channeling <laughs> Goya. Um, so, uh, all right. So, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna be very rude. If anyone would like to ask a question, we'll hang out here on the stage afterwards, and you can come up because it's it's rather late, and I don't want to keep uh, keep anyone. I would like to thank. Um, our contemporary patrons who support uh, our contemporary program, Parnas uh, Magazine, the Hotel Sans Souci, uh, all of my colleagues who um, uh, put on exhibitions like this, Angela Tune at David Zwerner and her colleagues for, for helping with the loan of the picture and everything, all of you for coming, but most of all, this remarkable man for rising to the challenge constantly over the last 30 or 40 years and meeting it 
um, every single time. So thank you, Kerry. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.